Hello, biology students. This is Mr. Ward, and this is a video lesson on Section 1, Climate, and our Chapter 4, Ecosystems and Communities. So by the end of class today, you should be able to define climate, describe the factors that contribute to global climates. Your key terms that will be due in your next Quizlet are weather, climate, microclimate, and greenhouse effect. Every day we look out the window uh, and we and or we ask uh, Siri or we ask uh, Alexa, what's the weather like today? So what exactly is weather? Weather is defined as conditions in the atmosphere at a particular place at a particular time. So as I'm <clears throat> creating this video lesson this morning, I'm looking out the window. It's a beautiful sunny day, a few clouds in the air. It's a nice crisp fall day. But that doesn't mean that we have the same weather by the Jersey Shore or in Sussex County, New Jersey, or even in Hunter County, New Jersey. So uh, weather is simply just the conditions in the atmosphere at a given place at a given time. <clears throat> However, climate is different. Climate is the average weather in, an, in a, over a long period of time in a given area. So we can compare the climate of New Jersey uh, in different seasons of the year. And it might look a little different in Sussex County, New Jersey, in the top western portion of the state versus Cape May, which is right by the ocean. So we know that even in, a, in kind of a short distance, uh, geographically speaking, uh, the top of our state versus the bottom of our state, we could have a, a slightly different climate during the course of the year. But climate is, is just defined as the average weather in a, in a place over a long period of time. Some of the measurements, or we call metrics of climate, are temperature, humidity, wind, and precipitation. And what we'll find is that a lot of organisms that live in a given place are able to acclimate or have been adapted over evolutionary history to live in that particular uh, environment, whether it's the temperature or uh, the precipitation totals. But in even within small places, there can be small scale changes in the climate. We call that a microclimate. So microclimate is defined as the environmental conditions within a small area that differs significantly from the climate surrounding it. So for example, a tree falls in the woods. Uh, it's laying on the forest floor. It's providing shade. It's trapped some moisture. It's cooler than the surrounding environment. And organisms thrive on that little change in, in climate, small microorganisms and other uh, smaller uh, animals. Uh, so microclimates are just these tiny little changes in, in climate with, uh, compared to the uh, surrounding area. In, in some ways, I think you could also compare a mountain range uh, in a given place, where at the bottom of the mountain, the weather conditions are a lot different than the top. And the pictures I gave for you in this presentation are the Arizona desert and the Smoky Mountains. You, we could probably see they're roughly about maybe the same elevation above sea level, but many, but very different climates. One is very dry versus one that uh, has a lot of humidity throughout uh, different parts of the year. So um, de uh, desert mountains and then other mountains in more temperate uh, climates can certainly have different climates, even the same elevation. Next up is solar energy and the greenhouse effect. And I think in some ways the greenhouse effect is often linked to global warming, which is true in some ways. The greenhouse effect is what is responsible for making our, our, our planet an inhabitable place. Uh, the, the, the difference is that global warming as we know it today, or also known as climate change, uh, is kind of considered a runaway greenhouse effect where the earth is warming way too fast than uh, it has in previous time periods. Uh, so the greenhouse effect is, is, is a good thing because without it, we wouldn't be able to have life on our planet. It would be, it would be way too hot during the day and way too cold uh, during uh, the, the nighttime. Uh, but the greenhouse effect is defined as the warming effect of air caused by heat rising from the surface of the earth and being trapped by various gases in a layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. Uh, the greenhouse gases that you may be familiar with are carbon dioxide, water vapor that we know as clouds, uh, and some others you may not be familiar with are chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, methane and nitric oxide, they all combine together to form this almost like a, a, a greenhouse uh, glass effect on the planet where light, as you can see in the diagram, light and yellow enters the atmosphere. Some may, may be reflected by the clouds, but others of it, it bounces right off the planet's surface and, unless it's absorbed by photosynthetic organisms. But in red, you can see the heat is trapped by the clouds. It's held in that layer of the atmosphere and it helps to make our planet uh, an inhabitable place where life can exist at various places. Next, we have latitude and solar energy. How does that affect the climate of a given place? So if you remember uh, your ge basic geography, 
Latitude is considered the distance from the equator measured in degrees, whether it's north or south, versus longitude, which is a, a measurement of east or west of a given place in, uh, in England. Uh, but latitude affects climate, uh, longitude does not. Uh, so and what we know is that the further uh, we find an ecosystem north or south of the equator, the less diverse it generally is just through the fact of the amount of solar energy it receives, which we know is, is latitude dependent. So in the diagram, we can see that sunlight uh, is directly overhead every day of the year along the equator. We can't say the same for the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. Obviously during our summer, we get more direct, or I should say spring in the summer, we get more direct sunlight overhead during, uh, during the year. Uh, and again, that is based not, uh, not necessarily just on latitude, but it's also based on the, the, this, the, the fact that the earth um, has a, a little bit of a tilt on its axis. So for the North America, the reason why we have different seasons is because at certain times of year, the, the, the tilt of the Earth's axis is pointed away from the sun. So it's getting even less direct sunlight, which accounts for our season, including fall and winter and, and, and spring. And then as the, uh, the, the Earth begins to shift and that axis that tilts, the Northern Hemisphere tilts towards the sun, that's when we get more direct sunlight over uh, in, in given months and that represents spring and summer and early fall, and just the opposite uh, for the Southern Hemisphere. So latitude greatly affects the incoming angle of sunlight. And if you remember, photosynthesis is what drives ecosystems, drives communities. So the more sunlight there is in a given place uh, for long periods of time, that's gonna be a more diverse, a lot, have a lot more energy to, available to the different trophic levels. Next, we have heat transport in the biosphere. Remember, the biosphere is that living, that thin layer of life uh, that lives in our planet. Uh, and life, again, is dependent on somewhat of a stable uh, environmental conditions. And a couple of facts that are very important to kind of understand how heat is transported throughout our planet is this concept of that cold air sinks, warm air rises. And as warm air rises in the upper atmosphere, where it gets cooler, that air is going to cool down uh, and then it'll sink back down. And we see that in the picture to the right here where my cursor is. So along the equator, uh, air is heated. It begins to, and it, because warm air rises, it begins to rise in the atmosphere, both uh, north of the equator and south. And as it cools, it sinks back down. It creates these kind of little, little currents. And we see it over and over again, moving further towards the North Pole and the South Pole. Now, while this is happening, we also have the Earth is spinning, uh, revolving uh, on its axis, and that creates various wind patterns shown here on the bottom. So the heating and cooling of air, the spin of the Earth, of the Earth creates these different wind patterns that we are very commonly know in terms of weather patterns. So for example, in North America, we know that we look to our, our weather from the west to the east. And this line, this little red line here with the arrow, that represents the Gulf Stream, which you may have heard of before. So weather, so uh, air current, that is responsible for moving air masses from the west to the east, so moving from California towards New Jersey. Uh, but in the southern hemisphere, as you can see, many of the, the arrows point in a different direction. That's again because it's a different part of the world. Uh, the spin of the Earth's axis is creating a different effect. But uh, wind patterns are the result of heating and cooling of air as and uh, rising and sinking air masses, uh, and also the spin of the Earth's uh, axis. So that's just an important uh, fact. Uh, to note. And we also see in this picture, uh, the first picture here, we see it's raining along the equator. That air uh, is going to be heated, that water is going to be heated, and that water vapor will be transported uh, up uh, towards the upper levels of the atmosphere. It's going to rise just like air masses. And as we know, those, wa those water molecules can slow down. They'll start to, to uh, bond to each other via hydrogen bonds, cohesion. When they get large enough, water droplets form condensation and then they fall back to Earth as precipitation. So not only do we see this rising um, and sinking of warm, and, of rising of warm air, cooling of, uh, and then sinking cold air, we also see the same thing of water vapor that also helps to transport some of that water throughout our planet. And not only do we have heating and, uh, and cooling of air mass, we also have heating and cooling of, uh, of water bodies, including the ocean. So the ocean, remember, uh, is a huge reservoir of heat meaning that it can hold a lot of energy. Uh, we remember that term specific heat. So uh, water holds large amounts of heat 
And just, just as air masses move across our planet, so do ocean currents. So we have that very, the, the same Gulf Stream when, when I mentioned the previous slide is also found uh, in the world's oceans. So the, our Gulf Stream travels roughly from the equator up North America coastline and then makes a right-hand turn and goes east towards Great Britain, Ireland. Uh, and it helps to bring warm water masses towards that island, those island countries, and keeps them fairly moderated in temperature. Uh, but if you go directly west across the ocean and hit northern Canada, you won't find that same effect because the, the, that current is not bringing warm water to that uh, given place. So oceans currents can distribute both warm air and cold water, cold, cold masses of water. So underneath that, those surface currents are deeper currents. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the warm water is rising, cold air is sinking, the earth is spinning, and it helps distribute this heat around our planet. So without this, uh, this effect, again, life would not be possible on our planet. And one last topic for the day that we'll be looking at more in section three of this chapter uh, are how do we demonstrate, how do we show, how do we uh, analyze the climate of a given area with diagrams, such as a climatogram. So a climatogram is simply a diagram of the climate of an area, and it's based on average temperature every month of the year and average precipitation during different months of the year. Something just to kind of remember is that the line graph always represents temperature, and the bar graph always represents precipitation. So, and we, and we read the climatogram just like we read a textbook, we read from left to right. So for example, we're trying to determine what is the average temperature in July in Washington, DC based on this climatogram, we would move from left to right, we'd move to July. We would then go up to the line graph. And this particular case actually tells us what the average temperature is in degrees Celsius in July. If we didn't have that average temperature shown right here, we would then, when we hit the line, we go directly to the right, to the y-axis that shows us temperature in degrees Celsius, right around 27 degrees. Same thing for precipitation. We want to know what's the average precipitation during July in, in Washington, D.C. We would do the same thing. We, in this case, we'd go up to the bar graph, top of the bar graph. And again, right, right below, it does show what that value is. But if we didn't have that number, we would just go directly to the left. And we would see it's right around 100 millimeters of precipitation uh, in, in, the, in July of in, in Washington, D.C. So climatograms are very useful uh, tools to help us better understand the climate of a different of an area over a long period of time. And also helps us to put that particular place in a uh, in the category of a biome. We'll be talking about biomes in uh, section three, as you probably maybe remember, we live in what's called the temperate deciduous forest, meaning we have uh, seasons and, our, and many of the trees, many of the plant species lose their leaves in the fall. We'll talk a lot about uh, the, that type of vegetation and different types of biomes in our in future uh, readings and in our upcoming uh, section three of chapter four. So that's what a climatogram is uh, and a useful tool for helping us understand climate.